Brain in a Vat, a philosophical thought experiment which poses the question, what if you and all of your personal experiences are not real? That your memories, everybody you know, even your own physical body are not real. Instead, you are just a brain in a vat of liquid hooked up to a computer to give you false memories and experiences. If that's true, then how can you prove that anyone else but you exist? This can be a difficult question to answer because you do not have access to other minds, as an ESP or psychic machine does not exist. And even so, how do you know even if that is real? The thought experiment would lead a person to ask, what if we can't truly know anything? Therefore, adopt a view of philosophical skepticism. This thought experiment is very similar to a philosophy named Rene Descartes' evil demon experiment, which is similar to Brain in the Vat, the difference in being the computer and a vat are replaced with an evil demon that has given you false memories. However, there are certain criticisms to this thought experiment that you cannot possibly be a brain in a vat because to even know what these things are, like brain and vat, these words are causally connected to the objects they reference in real life. If the referenced objects aren't even real in the first place, how can the fact that you are a brain in a vat be true if these things don't even exist in the first place? This thought experiment is also related to a concept called solipsism, which basically means you can only truly know that your mind exists and no one else's. Buridan's donkey. Imagine a donkey that is stood between two bales of hay but can only choose one to eat. However, these two bales of hay are completely identical in every way, but the decision to eat must be based on reason and logic. Well, the donkey ends up not making a decision at all and starves to death. This leads one to ask, if given multiple options between completely identical choices, if you can only choose one, how would a person of perfect logic make that decision? If you were thinking purely rationally, then you couldn't make a decision at all. However, this is not how people behave in the real world. The purpose of this is to get us to really think about how people navigate the world and how we make decisions. There are multiple factors which influence our decision making other than just pure logic. And if those external factors can alter our rational decision making so much, then can we even say that we truly have free will? But keep in mind, there is really no right or wrong answer for the donkey to pick. The purpose is to get us to think about how we would navigate the world given equal choices. Beetle in a Box, a thought experiment by Ludwig Wittgenstein in which he invites the audience to imagine that you have two people holding a box and on the box is written the word beetle, but neither person can look into the other person box, but they are allowed to describe what's in the box, and both people say they have a beetle. When both people are describing their beetle, can either person be sure they're talking about the same thing? The beetle in a box analogy helps with the understanding of the use of language and how they're tied into our personal experiences. When a person says the word beetle, that conjures up an image in our minds of what a beetle is. However, we can never be sure that the same beetle that is in our mind is the same in theirs. That's because words are not just their pure definitions, they're usually tied to ideas and concepts and those same concepts and ideas are usually born through the words use in daily conversation. For example, if you are asked what is a chair, a person might first appeal to the dictionary definition of chair, but then if one further asks, does a chair have to have four legs? Does it have to have a headrest? What about beanbag chairs? It starts to be clear that what a chair actually is may not be so straightforward. Despite this, we have no problems talking about chairs in our everyday conversation. Although Wittgenstein used the example of feeling pain and not chairs to describe what he was talking about, it's important to be aware that people don't have access to other people's subjective personal experiences and sometimes describing qualia to another person can be quite difficult. By the way, qualia is just a fancy word for subjective conscious experience. If you don't believe me, then try to explain the color red to a congenitally blind person or explain what being tickled is like to a person that has no nerve endings. Kavka's Toxin Puzzle Imagine that a wealthy billionaire shows you a vial of toxin and will offer you one million dollars if you drink it. The toxin will make you pay painfully and violently sick for 24 hours. However, it is not at all life-threatening and there are zero lasting effects. You have 24 hours to make a decision or you don't get the money. However, there is one interesting stipulation. The billionaire tells you that you don't even have to drink the poison to get the money, but you have to intend to drink it. However, the billionaire has a way to read your mind. So if your intent is not genuine, you don't get the money. And that decision must be made purely on your own, which means you can't have someone else force you to drink it. So, do you take the offer? And if you do, do you actually go ahead with drinking the poison? This thought experiment poses the interesting question, is it possible to intend to do something then consciously not do it? There have been many arguments of what decision to make here. Assuming that a person is reasonable, it would probably be worth it to intend to drink the poison. However, after the intention, it's not reasonable at all to drink the poison as there will be no added benefit and there will only be to your detriment. However, this will directly contradict with your intent to drink it. This thought experiment can also be a way to think about game theory, the evil god challenge. Posed by Stephen Law, it's a thought experiment 
experiment that demands the explanation for the existence of an omnibalevolent god when there is just as much evidence for an omnimalevolent god. This deals with the problem of evil, which is how can a good and all-powerful god exist when there is so much preventable evil and suffering in the world? The inventor of this thought experiment thought the argument for the existence of god seemed detached from his moral character, and in isolation, the arguments can easily justify an all-evil god as well as an all-good god. Original position, also known as the veil of ignorance. Imagine that you didn't exist yet, but you can be born into a society of your choosing. You can make that society into anything you want. However, the catch is you cannot choose where you will be born in that society. You cannot choose your social status, wealth, ethnicity, or gender. Where you'll be put is completely random. So, what type of society do you create? This thought experiment suggests that assuming a person is rational, they would probably create a society in which it gives everyone an equal chance of success. Theoretically, an altruistic person would benefit because this would reduce as much unnecessary suffering in the world as possible, and a self-interested person would benefit because it offers them the greatest chance of success with little to no roadblocks. Gava guy. Imagine you magically woke up on an island. You're trying to figure out your way home, and you spot a group of natives. Problem is, they're the only ones that exist on the island, and they speak a language that you've never heard before. So, no use in asking them for directions. But you notice that one of them says Gava guy when pointing to a rabbit. So you figure Gava guy means rabbit. But on second thought, you can't be sure that Gava guy means rabbit. It could just mean animal, or white, or fluffy. It can even mean food. You would need more context to truly know what Gava guy means. This problem has to do with a concept in philosophy called radical translation, which is the idea that true understanding is built upon finding clues, making guesses, and accepting the fact that perfect understanding may be a little bit complicated, if not impossible. Trying to understand language that is foreign to you is a bit like solving a puzzle, and knowing about the surrounding culture may give you greater understanding than just simply learning the words. Inverted spectrum. Much like the beetle in the box thought experiment, it's an idea that deals with subjective experience, or qualia. Basically, two people can identify the color red, but the actual experience of seeing red might be different for both people. This is most evident in people who are colorblind, a condition in which people actually do see colors in different ways than normal sighted people do. The Ideal Observer, an ethical thought experiment that states, the way to judge an action as morally good or bad is by appealing to an ideal observer. Imagine a person that is the judge of all morality. This person is perfect in logic and reason, and is perfectly neutral. This person is also infallible and cannot make any error. They are also always morally consistent, dispassionate, and possesses perfect knowledge and perception. They can place themselves in a situation and have perfect judgment, and can perfectly see and calculate all potential branching decisions, payoffs, and outcomes. And if you were to create another person with the same attributes, they will never contradict each other nor come to a disagreement about moral arguments. But lastly, as far as any other attributes, they are human, meaning this person is not a god or deity. They just possess perfect moral reasoning. The goal is to get people to behave in a way that an ideal moral observer would approve of. It also proposes a guideline on what is good and bad universally. However, many people have levied criticisms at this ideal, that the ideal observer's greatest strength can also be its greatest weakness. For example, being dispassionate can be a great tool in moral dilemmas, as it can lead a person to an objective answer. However, being completely emotionless when making a moral decision can actually cause moral issues. Let's say you had two people hanging off a cliff. One of them is a complete stranger, and the other is your daughter. And you can only save one. Who do you choose to save? An ideal observer would most likely judge the outcome on who to save with a coin flip, because logically, there's no meaningful difference between the two people. However, emotionally, there definitely is. And it seems judging moral situations this way would go against most human beings' moral intuitions. To a lot of people, a world like that would seem cruel and cold. Also, appealing to an ideal observer may be logically flawed. It doesn't really describe a criteria of what makes something good or bad, just if an ideal observer would approve it or not. If moral right and wrong are just what an ideal observer would like, then and it's kind of begging the question. It's good because an ideal observer would approve it. What would an ideal observer approve? Well, things that are good. Good is never really defined. The trolley problem, one of the most well-known thought experiments. Imagine there's a trolley barreling along a set of tracks. However, there's an upcoming fork with two paths, one with five people tied up and the other path containing a single tied up person. There's a lever to divert the train onto either path. So which do you choose? Do you not intervene and let the train run over the five people? Or do you pull the lever and let the train crush the single person? This dilemma 
deals with the philosophical problem of killing versus letting die. There are many versions of this thought experiment, some involving a bridge or somebody paying you to save them and even an organ transplant. The experience machine. Hedonism is defined as seeking pleasure and avoiding pain at all costs. The experience machine is designed to refute that idea. Imagine that you walked into a lab and a scientist shows you a giant device called an experience machine. You will be hooked up to this machine and for the next two years, you will be put in a virtual world that is indistinguishable from real life. In fact, once you're in the virtual world, you'll forget that you're in it. In this world, you have total control over what you experience. It is a world of full enjoyment, pleasure, and no pain, suffering, or sadness. You can live your wildest dreams and accomplish your greatest goals. At the end of the two years, you're given an ultimatum by the scientists. You can either go back to the real world and live out your normal life, or stay in the virtual world, but you can never leave for as long as you live. Which do you choose? It seems like most people would choose the latter, but often this is not the case. In fact, most people choose the first option. It seems that most people enjoy the actual experience of life despite all its issues than a mere facsimile of pleasures. Get your problem. Get your problems are not one experiment but a series of thought experiments to figure out if you really know something or if it's just a lucky guess. These come from a branch of philosophy called epistemology or the study of knowledge. Imagine that it's snowing outside. You look outside the window and you see someone shoveling snow. You're pretty sure it's your dad because you see the person wearing your dad's jacket. The person turns around and it turns out to actually be your father. But what if the same situation were to happen and the person turns around and it turns out that it's not your dad, that it's actually your next door neighbor borrowing your dad's coat. So did you really know it was your dad in the first scenario, or did you just get lucky? This is what get your problems gets us to think about. That there's a difference in claiming to know something, versus having a reason for knowing something, versus having a justified reason for knowing something. Pascal's Wager, an argument made by Blaise Pascal for the belief in God. Pascal says to approach the issue of whether or not you believe in God as if you were a gambler. Let's say the probability of the existence of God is very low. Well then, let's weigh the costs and benefits. If you believe in God and he exists, the benefit is eternal happiness in heaven. If you believe in God and and he doesn't exist, then you don't gain or lose anything. If you don't believe in God and he doesn't exist, then you don't gain or lose anything. But if you don't believe in God and he does exist, you risk an eternity of pain in hell. According to this decision analysis, Pascal makes the conclusion that it is more beneficial to believe in God than to not believe in him due to the cost benefit. However, there have been many criticisms of this thought experiment. Some argue that to adhere to a religious lifestyle is indeed a loss to your personal freedom. Others would say that the argument for Pascal's wager is interchangeable with any other religion or belief in a deity. And Pascal Pascal's wager doesn't tell you which one to choose, so if you pick the wrong one, you can still suffer an eternity in hell. The Prisoner's Dilemma Imagine you and your buddy got caught for a serious crime, and the interrogator offers you a deal. If you and your accomplice both confess, you each get one year in prison. However, if neither of you confess, you each get five years in prison. But if you confessed and your accomplice doesn't, you get off scot-free and he gets ten years in prison. But if he confesses and you don't, then you get ten years in prison and he gets let off free. So. What do you do? This is one of the most famous thought experiments in game theory. The choices are evaluated using a table called the payoff matrix. The outcome that is usually beneficial for both parties is called the dominant strategy, which is usually for you and your accomplice to confess. This equalizing of dominant strategies is called the Nash equilibrium in game theory. The plank of Carnades. Imagine you and a friend are shipwrecked out at sea. You both see a plank floating out in the water, but it's only sturdy enough to hold one person. So you manage to get on the plank, but you have to push off your friend in order to survive. Is what you did morally wrong? Or was it justified self-defense, picking the lesser between two evils? Either one person dies or both dies. Heinz Dilemma Let's say you had a child dying of a terminal illness. You know of a pharmaceutical company that possesses a cure, but your insurance won't pay for it. You tried to crowdfund the money, but it is not enough. You beg and plead with the company to bargain for a fraction of its price and explain to them the urgency of your situation. But despite your efforts, the company remains dispassionate. In an act of desperation, one night, you break into the company's headquarters and steal the medicine. You then return to the hospital to give it to your dying child. Is what you just did morally justified? Philosophical zombies. What if you were the only person on earth and everyone around you is just a zombie? Well, philosophically at least. You know that you exist and you know that you can deploy consciousness, but what is consciousness really? You would think it's just conscious awareness and the ability to feel senses and experiences. But what if there was a person who can completely and indistinguishably mimic the feelings and sensations of being conscious? How would you know that they don't have consciousness? It's not like you can read their mind. So how can you truly know that your mind is not the only one that truly exists? There's another thought experiment that attempts to answer this, proposed by Alan Turing. He says there may be a theoretical way that computers can have knowledge and consciousness. The way that we inductively reason that people have consciousness is by interacting with them. So why can't it be the same with computers? Let's say you put 10 people in a room, you have them all use computers, and put them in an online chat room to speak to other people. However, what they don't
don't know is, only half the participants are speaking to real people, the other half are speaking to bots. However, the bots are so sophisticated that interacting with them is indistinguishable from interacting with a real person. If our criteria for determining if someone has consciousness can be met by a computer, then what's to say that computers don't have consciousness as well, since we would be using the same metric for both. Because remember, we can't ever really truly know unless we have a mind reading machine. Ship of Theseus, what really makes you, you? This is what the ship of Theseus tries to answer. Imagine you have a ship that makes a voyage from point A to point B. However, Throughout that voyage, you start removing planks one by one and replacing them with new planks. When you finally arrive at your destination, all of the planks on the ship have been replaced with new planks. So, can you really call that ship the same ship? And if not, at what point did it become a different ship? To complicate things even further, what if you took all of the original planks and rebuilt the ship? Is the rebuilt ship the ship of Theseus? Or is the new ship the ship of Theseus? Or maybe, they're both the ship of Theseus. This experiment is to get you to think about the nature of identity and ontology. Ontology is the study of reality and what is or the nature of being. Drowning child. A thought experiment posed by Peter Singer on moral responsibility. Imagine you pass by a pool and you see a child in danger of drowning. You know the pool is shallow enough for you to swim in just fine. The only cost to you is that you ruin your clothes and electronics. So, should you be held responsible for saving the child at the detriment of your personal belongings, even though you weren't the one that pushed him in? According to Peter Singer, yes. He uses this thought experiment to make the argument for giving what you can to help children in danger all around the world. He noticed that a common excuse for not applying some effort into worthy causes was inconvenience. But if that inconvenience wouldn't stop you from saving a child next to you, why would that same inconvenience stop you from donating to a worthy cause to save a child across the world? Russell's teapot. Named after Bertrand Russell, the thought experiment goes like this. What if a person told you that there is a China teapot between planet Earth and Mars constantly orbiting in space? A common response would be to ask for proof that the teapot exists. But what if this person then told you that the teapot is so small that it can't be detected by satellites or telescopes, but this person assures you that it's there? When you ask how this person knows, the response is that it cannot be disproven that it's not there, so you have a dilemma. The person you're talking to can't prove that the teapot exists, but you can't prove that it doesn't exist either. Bertrand Russell used this analogy, that it is ridiculous to believe in something just because you can't disprove it. That the burden of proof lies on a person making the claim, not on the person trying to disprove it. It's not possible to prove a negative, so obviously the belief in the teapot would be ridiculous. The same standard applies to any claim that seems to be unfalsifiable. Be sure to share this video, and thanks for watching.